Hey, my name is Steve Watson, the Maricopa County School Superintendent, and thanks for joining us this morning with STEM Pro Live. And this morning we're at the Arizona Department of Water Resources, and we're going to meet two terrific people who are going to teach us all about their journey and all about water in the state of Arizona. So to my left we have Natalie Mast, who is an expert on water and water policy. And we also have Brian Conway, who's an expert on hydrology and subsidence. And we're going to find out more about what subsidence actually is. So the Department of Water Resources is a state agency and we are responsible for the water supplies across the state of Arizona. We are responsible for planning and managing those water supplies for the next hundred years and into the future. So let's go back to our offices and learn about our journeys and how we got into our careers at the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Hi, my name is Brian Conway with the Arizona Department of Water Resources and I am a hydrologist and I supervise the geophysics serving unit which is within the hydrology division. Today I'm going to talk about my story and my journey on how I got into the career here at the Arizona Department of Water Resources. At a very young age I was interested in the outdoors I did a lot of uh, hiking in backpacking, I was heavily involved with uh, Boy Scouts. I became an Eagle Scout. And I had a lot of really great teachers throughout my early years, in my elementary school days, in my middle school, junior high, and even high school. Uh, when I went to college, I went to uh, Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. It's a smaller school. And um, I knew that I was wanted to do a, a science degree I was thinking about maybe going into medicine like my father was, but I just knew I liked being outdoors too much. And my uh, freshman year in the summer, I um, started working for the U.S. Forest Service in Globe, Arizona as a uh, wildland firefighter, and I fell in love with that kind of work. Uh, it's very hard, demanding work, physical work, but you get to work with some amazing people. I made amazing friends that I'm still friends with today. And I continued to do that all through the summers of college and even after college. But then after a couple um, seasons and as I graduated from college, I knew the firefighting was something I really enjoyed doing. I enjoyed fighting the fire part, but the downtime, not so much. And I wanted to be able to use my brain. And so that's when I looked at the University of Arizona for their hydrology program. It's one of the better hydrology programs in the United States. They have an undergraduate and a graduate program. So I entered their Master's of Hydrology program. While I was there working on my thesis, I needed to get data for my, um, for my project. And I came to the Arizona Department of Water Resources here in Phoenix. And I um, spoke to someone in the modeling section within the hydrology division here where I work and I asked them if they could help me acquire some data. They're extremely helpful at the time. And while I was talking with the groundwater modeler, I asked him if they had an internship available. And he said, we actually are hiring right now for them. You should apply for one. So I applied for it, and that was in June of 1999. So it's been a little bit over 19 years now that I've worked for the Arizona Department of Water Resources. So earlier when Steve Watson introduced Natalie and I, he mentioned that um, I'm an expert in hydrology and uh, land subsidence. So a lot of you are probably wondering what land subsidence is. If you think of a bowl of Rice Krispies with cereal and milk in it, and you put a straw in it and you start to suck on that straw, the milk level will start to be drawn down in the bowl and the Rice Krispies will come together and collapse. That's what's happening in the aquifers around Arizona. As we pump too much groundwater than, than what is naturally being replenished or even artificially being replenished, the finer grain sediments start to collapse and reorganize, and that's called land subsidence. So one cool thing that we can do with the subsidence data is that we can model it and turn it into a 3D image, and so this is a highly exaggerated image of the subsidence data out in what we call the Hawk Rock area. It's an East Mesa Apache Junction area. And you can see right here, this is Mesa Gateway Airport right here. This is the Red Mountain Loop 202, and then the US 60 comes across right here. There's a lot of infrastructure that comes across here. So the reasons why we're monitoring subsidence 
around the state is first of all, we want to know what's happening with us pumping too much groundwater in, area, in areas. When the ground compacts, it won't recover for the most part. Sometimes it can recover in the initial stages of subsidence, but after it's subsided long enough, that storage space that used to hold water in it is now compacted. And so we're losing storage space to hold water for the future. And then it's also changing the natural floodplains. So areas that didn't flood are now flooding because the floodplains are being changed from the slopes changing, just like in this image here. With the 3D image, you can see how this also used to be a totally different slope, and now it's been changed by the subsidence. We have earth fissures all in this area that are, that are impacting utilities and roads and causing um, millions of dollars of damage around the state and having to mitigate this. And it's a hazard that can happen when earth fissures open up under roads. And so what we'll do is, when these earth fissures open, we'll go out there with a drone with the Arizona Geological Survey, and we'll actually fly in the earth fissure if we can to get pictures of it, and then also above it to get a better aerial view of what's going on with the earth fissure. We have a really cool video for you guys to see of the drone flying of this earth fissure here. This is down in Pinal County um, to the west of the Cacho Mountains, if you're familiar with, the, with that area. So the, the drone will fly down in the earth fissure. And then what these earth fissures are, when you look at them, they're much larger cracks. They can go for anywhere from a couple hundred yards to five to 10 miles. And so they try to fix these, but sometimes the repairs don't hold and they fail, causing the ground to open back up. You can see in these pictures, there's infrastructure in here. There's utility lines that have been cracked. Sewer lines could be damaged. Water lines could be damaged. It's all very important infrastructure that needs to be maintained. And so those are the reasons of why we're collecting this data around the state with the groundwater data that we collect the um, earth fissure data that the Arizona Geological Survey collects and the subsidence data that we collect. And it's all a synergy of all this data to build and manage um, the groundwater resources around the state. And now we'll go to Natalie and see how she's taken this data and data that's reported to our agency for um, water management and water planning around the state. Hi, my name is Natalie Mast, and I work in the Active Management Areas group at the Department of Water Resources. A little bit different from what Brian does, my job is to take the data that is coming into the department, both from our internal resources like Brian and from external sources, and help compile that to uh, describe how, how we are managing our water resources and make plans for managing those water resources moving forward. So as a part of that, we create breakdowns of different types of data. So one example of this is talking about where our water supplies come from. 38% uh, of our water in this state comes from the Colorado River currently, and 41% is from groundwater, water that is underground, like Brian talked about. Another way that we break it down is by use sectors. So in this state, 74% of our water use uh, is agricultural, uh, which those of us who live in the cities might not necessarily realize right away if, if we don't necessarily see that every day. Another thing that we as the department work on is uh, how is our water being managed over time? Since the 1980 groundwater law went into effect, our water use as a state has actually gone down over time as the gross domestic income and the population of the state have both increased dramatically. Um, another way that this information is used by the department is to help craft long-term management plans in our active management areas to help us to reach these goals, help us to manage water use across the state in a lot of different ways and across many different sectors. I, as a kid, was always really interested in science and I uh, really liked being outside. I was outside a lot with my family, hiking and camping. 
and um, I always knew that I wanted to do something science related. Uh, I went to uh, college and got my associates in chemistry and actually uh, with that degree I worked as a product development scientist working on liquid detergent, liquid laundry detergent formulas for uh, some time and while I was working there full time I kind of realized that I'd like to go a slightly different direction uh, with, my, with my career and uh, started um, uh, work to finish my bachelor's degree in environmental science. Um, part of that coursework in my, for my bachelor's degree uh, was to do an interview uh, with someone, some environmental science professional. And um, the person that I interviewed at uh, was a sci soil scientist at Tonto National Forest. And he mentioned that water was going to be a really interesting issue in the future. And we talked about how interconnected water is with everything. Um, and that was something I'd always been really fascinated with, is these connections between your traditional subjects, uh, uh, where water really touches chemistry and geology and biology and uh, policy and economics and all of these different, usually kind of separate categories. It really intersects very deeply with all of these. Um, so as I was finishing my studies, I started to do more and more research um, about water in Arizona and was lucky enough to apply for and uh, be offered a job with the department. Um, my first job here was working under the Arizona Water Initiative, uh, where we were working more with the rural areas to um, update their supply and demand information um, and to uh, create better information in these rural kind of unregulated areas where we don't have good reported information. Um, and here I am using some of those data skills that I developed working under the Water Initiative, but using them kind of in a different way to compile that data and start to craft uh, more policy around our management plans for the active management areas. Part of what I really enjoy about my job is, yes, the interconnected nature of water kind of touching all of these different categories, but also that it touches the everyday lives of all Arizonans. So what we do here and my work here really gets to contribute toward the long-term water security of every Arizonan across the state. All right, we're going to transition into the live question and answer portion of our broadcast. My name is Brian Hoffner, and I'm here with Brian Conway and Natalie Mass from the Department of Arizona Water Resources. And we have some questions coming in, but there's still time if you have some questions that you can send us. We're going to get to as many as we possibly can. So the first question that came in is, uh, is sh we we're listening to your guys' stories, and we were listening to how you guys are working. Um, the, one of the questions that they have is, is this something that you guys do? Do you guys work individually or more as a team at the office? Uh, my position is a little bit of both, where some of my tasks are me working with data specifically in spreadsheets, but a lot of the work I do is working closely with different people in my group and across the agency to collaborate on different types of data and analyses. And mine's about the same as well. I do a lot of um, individual work with processing the satellite data and um, looking to other data sets, but then I'm sharing it um, internally. And then also I do a lot of uh, collaborative work with other agencies outside the department. Nice. Uh, we have a question that came in. So they were talking about subsidence and they were talking about uh, some of the land fissures. Uh, is that what a sinkhole is? Um, no, a sinkhole is different. A sinkhole is, can form from uh, from the subsurface material being dissolved, which is called a karst, or it can even be formed by a, a, a water pipe that has um, busted and is uh, eroding the material below it and then causing it to collapse. Nice. Uh, one of the questions that we have is, how much water does Arizona use in a year? And is this something that you guys cover as part of your job? Uh, that is a part of, uh, well, both of our jobs, but my job specifically to uh, help um, 
aggregate those numbers. Uh, Arizona as a whole uses about 7 million acre feet per year, um, and an acre foot is uh, the amount of water that it would take to cover one acre with one foot of water. Nice. So. Um, let's see here, another question that came in. Are the cracks, the fissures that we saw, harmful and dangerous to people? Yeah, they can be harmful if, um, if you were to, to be walking by one and it hasn't collapsed all the way at the surface. So if you were to step on the part that hadn't collapsed, you could obviously fall into that. There's been cases where uh, vehicles have driven into them and then even um, uh, livestock, has, uh, cattle have fallen into them as well and, and died. So they, they could be definitely um, a danger to people if you're, if you're not aware of them. Um, so how do we fix issues like that in our system? So if, if we get these cracks in the roads, like what's the, how do we fix that stuff? So uh, different counties or cities will um, patch them, but usually what they have to do is they have to do some sort of geotechnical work where they put a, 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 a more supportive material in the subsurface and then they um, resurface the road. But you need to keep water away from those cracks because those cracks will always be there in the subsurface as a hairline crack and when the water hits those cracks in the subsurface, it starts to erode it and it can work its way all the way up to the surface. Uh, how has how has your work and research with water changed um, your day-to-day -day habits with water? So what do you do differently personally now that you know this stuff professionally? I definitely find myself noticing it more everywhere. Uh, I, I go on vacation and I pay attention to the landscapes and how that water moves across the landscapes. And in personal habits, I uh, definitely uh, talk to my family about, well, making sure you're turning off the faucets and changing how you water your plants outside and those types of things. It's definitely something I at least pay attention to. And, I, and I'm the same way. And, and when I'm driving you know, through my neighborhood on a weekend or something like that, and I see someone watering their grass in the middle of the afternoon at 1 or 2 p.m. in the middle of summer, it's not water wise to be doing that because a lot of that water is just evaporating. You should be watering your, your lawn either in the early mornings or uh, later at night so it won't evaporate. Nice, I have a question from Mr. Anway's fifth grade class at Kyrene de la Colina and that is how are fissures different from earthquakes? Um, earth fissures are for, formed from uh, um, excessive groundwater pumping at least in Arizona they are. Um, earthquake faults are formed by the, um, from the shifting of the land from the fault that occurs. And so that the, the faults are already, are already there and so you get displacement that occurs when there's been an earthquake rupture. Whereas the earth fissure are tension cracks that are forming, forming because the ground is subsiding at different um, amounts in a, in a small area. Nice, and Natalie, I think this question was for you. Uh, how did you like working as a chemist? And were there uh, many other females that were working in that same profession? Uh, I enjoyed it, some parts of it at least. I really enjoyed um, the challenge of it, that it, I, I enjoyed the lab work. Um, but I also, I, I kind of shifted away from that because I wanted to uh, do something a little more practical and that I could see more impacts of in my everyday life. Um, as far as uh, women working in that field, I, I know kind of in the past it has seemed to be a very male-dominated uh, field, but at least where I was working it was very much evenly split between men and women. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so this question is, do we have enough water to share with Nevada and California? I know you guys talked about our different water resources and where it comes from. Is that something we're currently sharing with other states and do we have enough? So the Colorado River is shared amongst several states, including Cali uh, California and Nevada. Um, and that's something that is subject to ongoing conversations. It's something we pay a lot of attention to and, and manage very closely, paying attention to how much water each state is using, how much we're using, and how if there is less water coming from the Colorado River, how we might uh, make, how we might share any shortage. So uh, I, I guess to answer the question, uh, we, there, there is enough. Each of those states does plan for that kind of variability in the water for, for differences in those supplies. Um, and we in Arizona have been planning for a long time for um, variances in our water supplies and, and to make sure that we have enough for our future. Nice. 
Uh, this question is from Grace. Uh, she said she's from San Francisco, but she's living in Arizona. How does heat affect the amount of water that we have and how we manage it? Does temperature play a role in what you guys do? Is that something you look at? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, we don't really, I mean, climate change can obviously have an effect on, you know, how much, you know, how much uh, water might be recharging the aquifer. You might, if you have climate change, that might result in um, less precipitation. So for like drought that we've been having in the Southwest for, you know, almost two decades now on and off, um, that can definitely play a role in how much water is there to replenish the aquifers. Nice. So this question is for both of you. What education did you have to have to do your job? So I have a bachelor's degree in environmental science, um, but my, I, I do feel like my experience in different types of science and chemistry and just uh, working with data has given me um, a, a good knowledge set and skill set um, to be able to do different types of data analyses. I appreciate my education and I think it gave me a good base level understanding of the types of things I work on, but a lot of the things that I do on a daily basis, I really had to learn on the job. And for my position, you need to have a bachelor's of science as a minimum. My undergraduate degree is in environmental science, and then I went to graduate school for a master's in hydrology. Um, but the environmental science degree would have easily um, been sufficient for the position, the hydrology um, graduate school definitely helped with you know understanding hydrologic processes and everything. But the majority of the stuff that I learned, it was all on the job training and learning for the kind of the specialized work that I do with subsidence monitoring. Nice. Uh, this question came in: How do we know how much water has how much water Arizona has to use each year? Uh, we assess um, both supplies and demands in a lot of different ways. Um, we, have, we have several different types of supplies that we use in Arizona from uh, surface water and Colorado River water and groundwater, and we also use uh, reuse water in the form of effluent. Um, so we track all of those things as a function of how it is used on an annual basis, but Brian also tracks the specifically the groundwater on a more comprehensive basis, I think. Right, so we have groups within our, our field section that go out and measure groundwater levels throughout the state at over 1,800 wells around the state that they measure um, every year. And so that gives us an accurate um, kind of picture of what's going on with groundwater levels. Are they increasing? Are they dropping? And so that helps us better understand, you know, how much water is available in different areas. Nice. That kind of leads us into this question. This is from the eighth grade STEM class at Sonoran Foothills. What tools do you have to collect? It says test water. Do you guys test water there or are you guys just mostly measuring to help manage? We don't uh, test the quality of water, okay. but uh, again, Brian's group does do well measurements. Right, so when we, when we measure wells, we have what's called a, a sounder and it's just a wire a wire with a probe on it with an exposed piece of wire that is dropped down the well and you have a voltmeter on it or um, a that will spike when that exposed wire hits the um, water table um, creating the circuit and so when that voltmeter spikes you know that you're in the in the groundwater and so then you measure the distance on your um, on your wire we have incremental marks so we know how deep it is into the groundwater and gives us depth of water and then you can also get water level elevation um, measurements because you know what the land surface is as well. Nice. Uh, let's see here. I have a question again from Mr. Anway's fifth grade class at Kyrene, which is, uh, will we see changes in landforms because of subsidence? Um, Yes, yeah, so the land as it, the land as it sinks, it's definitely it's changing. It's it's um, it's slow, even though we've seen up to 19 feet of subsidence in a couple areas of Arizona. It's a slow process, but what's happening is that the uh, the floodplains and flood slopes are changing, and so to the naked eye, you won't see that. But when you 
have rain events or flow events, you'll see areas that didn't flood are now flooding because the natural drainage slopes have changed. Uh, so here's another question that came in. Is your department connected with SRP? Mm, no, not directly. No, no, no not directly. Um, we do interact a lot with SRP, but uh, we're not formally connected, no. Okay. Uh, so another question is, did you guys know that this job that you're doing existed when you guys were in school? Like, is this something that you knew about, that you were aware of? I, I didn't really know. Um, I, I was always just kind of interested in science and the outdoors, and, and I was lucky enough to land in a job that, that is able to uh, focus on, on both of those things. Uh, I'm about the same. I, I mean, I knew what a hydrologist was, but I didn't know about studying it, about subsidence in the work that I do now existed until after I actually started working at the department. Uh, it says, how do places get flooded? So how do places flood normally? So if you think about um, your street that you live on, if you were to move your house lower below the street and sit above the street, the water is going to follow the, the natural drainage slope. And so instead of going down the street, away from your house, it's now going to um, spill off the street into your house. And so that's why we see areas that didn't flood are now flooding. Nice. So this question came, I think it was more of an observation that, that they said that, why does Lake Pleasant water levels always go down when we have so much water saved? Is this where we save our water? That Lake Pleasant is only one place where water is saved. So those levels might change based on how that particular reservoir is being managed and where those deliveries are going. Um, but we, across the state, have a number of different uh, both surface type reservoirs. Um, Roosevelt Lake is an example. Um, but we also store quite a bit of water underground, so in places where you might not necessarily see it. Nice. All right, so unfortunately this is our last question because we're getting close on time. But as we listen to you guys describe your journey into this profession, this isn't something that you guys planned on your whole life. It wasn't like you knew at a young age that you were going to be a hydrologist. So if you could go back and you could give yourself some advice and say, you know, if I could talk to elementary school me or middle school me or high school me, what's something that you wish you would have known or you'd have thought about or been aware of when you were in school still? Um. It's, it's a tough question. Uh, for, for me, I think it would have just been, you know, just keep working on science and math like, you're, like I did. Um, one of my weaknesses was I wasn't a real strong reader, so maybe, you know, I've read more. Um, you know, in the spare time, read books more, um, because that definitely would have, I think, helped. Um, prepare me for some more of the technical reading that I, I do a lot in my in my job, um, which has forced me to become a strong reader. Um, and then, you know, just keep doing stuff outside, uh, especially these days with all the electronics that kids have. You don't see as many kids outside. You know, try to stay outside, enjoy Arizona hike, and and um, try to understand the different processes that are going on outside. That'll definitely keep you interested in. Um, in fields within the STEM. And, and I would say something similar, just, just keep paying attention to things. Water uh, in both of our jobs really just kind of touches such a broad range of things that learning about um, different pieces of it, learning more about even economics and um, politics and all these different things that, that water does impact in, in how it gets used. and and how we manage it across the state. It's um, it, paying attention to those less sciencey things, but also the science and how the science impacts those things is, is really important and something that I didn't always realize as I was really focusing only on science. Nice. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for coming in, for choosing this profession that has such a big impact on all of us, and for taking the time to come in and share your stories with us and your journeys. Um, as usual, we'll be sending out an email with a link to this broadcast. So if there's any part that you missed, or if you want to forward this on to some of your friends or colleagues who you think might be interested, please look for that. 
There will also be some other opportunities in that email. The first thing is about our student STEM challenges that we send out every month called Solve It. This month's Solve It is going to be on water resources. So you might be able to take some of the concepts that they're talking about that they're using in their profession and apply it to a real STEM community-based problem that you can see in your schools and in your areas. The other opportunity is for my teachers out there. So teachers, if you're looking for an opportunity to interact with a professional like Brian or Natalie, we have opportunities where you can virtually meet one-on-one -on -one with a teacher that they can come into your classroom through technology and talk to your class. In that email, there's going to be a link for you to fill out some information so you can talk to people like this using our STEM Pro and Industry Connections. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you guys next month.